Welcome to the Compounders Podcast, where we explore the anatomy of public company wealth creation stories. On this show, we invite you to be a fly on the wall for the actual conversations professional investors have with public company CEOs. I'm your host, Ben Claremont, a partner and portfolio manager at Cove Street Capital. In these conversations, I interview senior executives by posing the exact questions I ask as part of Cove Street's diligence process. Whether you are a professional investor, founder, or someone who is simply interested in business, we think this podcast has something for you. This season of Compounders, The Anatomy of a Multibagger is sponsored by Tegas. Tegas is an innovative and disruptive company that is changing the way professional investors work. For more information, please visit their site at tegas.co. All opinions expressed by your hosts and the podcast guests are solely their own opinion and do not reflect the opinion of Cove Street Capital or any affiliates. This podcast is for informational purposes only. It is not investment advice and should not be relied upon for any investment decisions. We are not recommending the purchase or sale of any securities. The hosts and guests may be beneficial owners of the securities discussed. You should not assume that the securities discussed are or will be profitable. My guest on the show today is Brian Lane, the president and CEO of Comfort Systems, a $3.6 billion market cap company that provides mechanical and electrical services, including installation, repair, and maintenance to customers in the U.S. Brian became CEO in 2011 and over the last 11 years has overseen very impressive revenue growth and stock performance. The company has consistently made acquisitions over the last decade, but still has a lot of white space left domestically. Given Comfort Systems track record and runway for future growth, it was great to talk with Brian about Comfort Systems acquisition philosophy and its value proposition to potential targets, how the company is approaching a potential recessionary period in the US, the process by which Comfort Systems has built up a recurring revenue base, the structure of the industry from a competitive perspective, and how the company is overcoming both inflationary and labor availability challenges. For full disclosure, Co Street is not a Comfort Systems shareholder. And without any further ado, here is my conversation with Comfort Systems CEO, Brian Lane. As always, we will start this podcast off at a pivotal moment in the company's history. Brian, you took over as CEO in 2011, but you had been with the company since 2003. Due to some extent, the tough external environment, the stock ended up being basically flat from the end of 2007 to the end of 2012. During your first few years, the country was still reeling from the financial crisis. What did you see as a major opportunity to create value as a new CEO? Hey, Ben, it's great to be with you today, and um, I appreciate the question. So um, uh, I'm really fortunate to be here at, you know, at Comfort Systems. I think the foundation that you have in a business like this is the people, the quality of the work, and the good customers we have. But back around coming out of that, you know, the time frame of 2008, 2009, we really did a deep dive into our strategy what we're doing, what did we learn the last 13 years and what we needed to change. We came up with pretty much four fundamental um, aspects that we wanted to pursue. One of them was in construction. Not so much look to grow construction, but get better at it. Be more productive, quality of work, being pristine, and also being better on our safety front. The second thing we did was we made an all out effort to grow our service business. Service is a great business. It's a great follow-on from construction. We invested a considerable amount of money in it, in both people, equipment, and technology. And that's, you know, we've tripled the business over the last 10 years. So that's been a a real win for us. The third thing we did, we started taking a deeper look at technology. It was sort of the early days when labor was becoming tighter. Not like today, but it was getting tighter. And how could we apply some of the technologies that were out there to help us, you know, in the field, help the folks that are doing the real work to become more, you know, more productive? And then the last thing we did is uh, acquisitions. Uh, over the last 10 years, we've done a number of them. They've really worked out well. And um, encompassing all that was um, a significant investment in training. We've been training right through every day, some training going on. And I think those are the five aspects that really helped us develop a business and get to where we are today. And we're going to talk a lot about the acquisition side as well, because you've been quite active there. But I did, you did say something that was really interesting to me about technology. Maybe talk a little bit about 
innovations that have occurred in the space and how you use technology and, and how you started to use it then. And then maybe what's what's transpired over the last decade in terms of new opportunities to employ technology. You know, it's really interesting. If you sort of go back in time, construction and agriculture have been really the worst two users of technology, according to a study McKinsey did. And it's probably right. For years, when I started in this business in the 80s, Plenty of labor was available. You were never really short of labor. Um, always could find folks to do the work. And that really started changing in the 90s to where we are today. Um, and everybody makes an all out effort to find more people. But I think technology is the key to the future, where we can do more of the work with less people. Some examples, prefabrication. We are building more stuff in the shop, bringing it to a job site, all assembled. Um, takes a significant you know, less, less amount of men and women to do that type of work. The other thing that we made an investment, investment in was modular. We have two shops. Well, we have like six shops, about a million and a half square feet of capacity to build a full mechanical system, a full central processing unit in our shops in Greensboro, North Carolina, here in Houston. That's a huge win because in those shops, we can use more automated welding, um, cutting, burning, et cetera. So that allows you to really use some advanced technologies, take labor out of the workforce, become more productive, safer, you know, and just leave less people to produce the same amount of work. So um, I think we're at the very tip of the iceberg in construction on what I think you'll see come out um, over the next 10 to 20 years for sure. And I want to dig in further on the labor question in, in, a, yeah. in a few minutes, because I know that's a big issue right now. Yep. But, um, you know, it's looking at the chart of the stock since you became CEO, Comfort Systems is up. I mean, based on my calculations, about 700 percent since then. I mean, that's pretty impressive returns over the last decade or so. So what you know, what do you think if you had to categorize you know, the reasons for that success? What would you say there? And then how how pivotal have those, you know, that strategy change where you identified those five areas? Has that been a big driver of that success, do you think? Now, I think, you know, the, you know, the five focus areas, for sure, a big driver. But at the end of the day, it's the folks out in the field doing the work. We have 14,000 employees. 85% of them have some kind of tool in their hands, whether mechanical, electrical, plumbing, you name it. Um, that's really the heart and soul of Comfort Systems, providing a good service to our customers, um, getting repeat business, you know, and taking care of the people that do that work. They're the ones that drove those results. Um, and we're very fortunate to have really an elite workforce um, here that takes care of our customers, but also do it, you know, ethically with integrity, integrity safely, et cetera. So we're very fortunate and blessed to have the workforce we have. I think that's a perfect segue to my next question, um, because there can we you know there's all plenty of companies where the corporation can be successful and then the person working in the field doesn't really even feel that or see that yeah. so how have you thought about making sure that someone who's been in a field a field worker in Georgia for example for 15 years appreciates the success you've had and also has a chance to benefit from the results that the company has has produced well i really appreciate that question ben uh, your focus and asking about how the folks that are out there doing the work because they're the ones, you know, every day to get up, you know, and get after it. Even during COVID, they never miss a day of work at these job sites. And that's probably the most impressive thing I've seen in my career. Um, service our customers, particularly on the medical front, we did a lot of really good work at that time. So if you look at the field in particular, this is construction and service I'm talking about. You know, the number one thing those folks usually want is training. So we have all levels of training, starting with field, right? Whatever your skill trade is, uh, foreman, superintendent, project management, leadership, sales, service technician. So we have made a huge commitment, no matter what the markets are, we have never slowed down our training. And that's one way we can give back to the people right away. They can get better and hopefully have a better family life, make their family lives better with the money they can make. We have an I'm really proud of our benefit package, medical, dental, 401k to everybody in the organization and really encouraged. And we do a lot of financial training so that the folks understand you know, what to do, what their options are, um, et cetera. 
Uh, we also have a nice life insurance program for people. Um, so on top of all that, you got to fairly compensate them, right? They got to be compensated properly in the market they are. So one advantage that I think we have is we're decentralized. We have operating companies throughout the country. We have a very small corporate staff. I believe decisions should be made closest to where the customers are and where your, where your field forces are. So we can adapt to whatever local markets are required, you know, in terms of getting back whichever popular, you know, in the current city you might live in. But one thing that we've done that's probably really makes me, you know, happy here is that during Hurricane Harvey in Houston here, we had about 50 inches of rain. A lot of our people were displaced and I was getting calls throughout the organization. People wanted to help, right? How do we help? How do we help? Let's send money. So we put together a fund that comfort people can employ, can contribute to corporate, the company contributes to. And it's for our people, if they're in some kind of distress, we saw what's happened in Kentucky this year with the flooding and the tornadoes. We've had a lot of hurricanes that our people can tap into and get cash. Because when the electric goes down, the one thing I learned, I grew up in the north, not a lot of hurricanes. There's no power. You can't, the ATMs don't work. So we're able to get money to people quickly that they can carry on living. And that's something that I'm really proud of to help the people, um, you know, that do the work in the field. So that's, that's something that's really worked well for us over the last few years. You highlighted um, a number of co interesting cultural elements there. And my guess is that helps with retention of people. So let's, let's jump in on the labor question. So Labor availability is a major issue across the U.S., especially when it comes to skilled people. Comfort system needs to hire. So, how do you? How have you been dealing with that in the short run, especially with you know obviously COVID being a big impact there? But also, how do you? How are you thinking about the long run? And 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 obviously, technology is going to be a part of that. But how do you think about the long run? As as it just appears that like there's a lot of skilled tradespeople who are going to retire without an obvious batch of people to replace them. Well, Ben, if you solve that problem, buddy, come on down. The labor one is, a, you know, it's a day-to-day -day struggle. So uh, everybody's doing everything they can, right? In every company that has blue-collar trades, right? Um, you hit the high schools, community colleges, military, and all the conventional things. You know, everybody's doing that. Um, but what we have done, and we did at the end of last year, we bought a temporary service agency in Indianapolis, Indiana, Indiana, that had a large number of skilled tradespeople. So I think when you talk about labor shortage, you're really talking about people who have a skill. They're a welder, they're a pipe fitter, or electrician. Um, so we have access to about 3,500 of those folks, and they all, they're all travelers. They don't want to work full-time for a company. They want to go job by job. So we're able to flex our workforce with that uh, agency with travelers, and so far the last eight months, you know, we've got our return back and what we paid for it already. Um, the other thing we have, since we are a collection of about 45 companies, 120 locations, is sharing labor. Particularly the companies that are close to each other, you know, taking taking some folks for you know three to four weeks or whether they need them to. So that's another advantage, you know, that we have being nationwide. But the biggest bang for the buck we're getting right now is that uh, labor agency that we pur purchased to, you know, to, to get us open up. We have a huge backlog to do. So every man, woman, and child we have in here is working right now. So long term, you've hit on the key thing, which I think is technology. Um, I think the, the country is, there's tons of work. Reshoring is real. Um, so there's no shortage of work. So we're just going to have to do more work with less people and utilizing things like prefabrication, modular. Even on the service side, you know, we have some tools now that if you're on the roof of a building looking at a unit, something's wrong. The service tech can visually show it to a tech that's probably a little bit older and not doing the work anymore and showing the problem. And that, that other tech can help the guy on the roof, you know, get through the problem rather than having to go back to the office, figure it out, et cetera. That has been hugely successful. We've been on about a year and it grows with more techs using that every day. And it's things like that. I don't think there's gonna be any home runs, Ben, in, in construction of service. There's gonna be a lot of singles and doubles. 
um, to improve uh, productivity, you know, safety and quality. I think that's been a great overview of the the culture and the labor side. We'll we'll we'll, we'll I think we'll come back to culture um, towards the end, but maybe let's t- take a step back and talk about the industry. So maybe can you describe? Maybe you'll be uh, willing to describe the structure of the industry as it relates to competition. Are you mostly com- in competition with mom and pops? Are there larger regional players? Is there anyone who's truly national? Maybe just give us a the sense of the competitive landscape. Yeah. So it's a. Um... It's a funny industry. It's very fragmented, right? It's a definition of fragmented if you're doing a business case on it. Um, both mechanical and electrical, more so mechanical than electrical. Um, there's a lot of local mom and pops, as you said. Most of these companies try to restrict about a hundred mile radius of their office where they're going to work, um, just so that people can really travel there in a day and get back, you know, so to speak. So across the footprint. A lot of local mom and pops. There's a few regional players. The national players would be a company called MCOR up in Connecticut. They're more on the union side. Um, us, maybe on the, on the non-union side, there's a company called API in Minnesota, do a lot of life safety systems. But not a lot of national you know, players. Most of this is you win the work in the town or community you live in. You tend to know the people. Um, and how we go to market is different in construction and service. So in construction, we're usually working for a general contractor that might be national, regional, or just someone working in Tampa, Florida. Um, heavily based on relationships, we've, known, we've been in business a long time, the companies we buy. So we know everybody in town. Sometimes you go to direct to the owner, tech in particular, you tend to contract exec- directly to the owner. Now on service, it's totally different. You're selling door to door, right? Every building has a separate service agreement for the most part. So that's required in direct direct sales force. So we go to market two different ways, a lot of local competitors and um, um, and I'll see, and then electrical, very similar, although there seems to be bigger electrical companies. It's an older industry than air conditioning. So yeah, I think you see some more larger, more established players in that business. And given the importance of localization, I'm interested in what the value is of having a well-known brand and maintaining the scale that Comfort Systems has, especially when you're competing with a lot of local players. Is there, like, how does that, how does the brand travel even when the, 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 you know, individual kind of blocking and tackling in markets is, is, is very localized? I think on the construction front, Ben, it's, um, you can get, for example, say there's a project going on in Dallas with a, a local or a Texas-based general contractor, but he's won some work in mid Wisconsin that he wants a comfort systems company to do it that does the work the same way we do in Texas. Well, we'll pass that customer along to our local company in whatever, whatever state or city that general contractor wants to work in. So having a national footprint allowed us to keep the work in-house but just done by different operating companies. So that's really works well for us in construction and service. Now we have a whole national account business. So we'll work for some of the national brands. We have a contract with them centrally, but then we farm out the work to wherever our level local operating company is, whether you're in Boston or you're in you know, Seattle, Washington, and we'll take care of whatever facility, facility they have with the local people. Um, the other thing that really shown its head, I think, during COVID was financial strength. Um, I, I just saw it more robust during that period or people that they know you're going to be here to finish the work. And, you know, having a national footprint, footprint with the balance sheet we have was uh, gave a lot of our customers a lot of comfort that we could finish the work that they had. So. And you've mentioned and described the decentralization that this company operates with. I'm interested in how you've thought about local autonomy versus corporate oversight. And, and, and has that, has your sense of, of that balance changed over time? Um, so I grew up um, in a centralized construction company, right? Uh, with worldwide, this business just doesn't lend itself to that. Um, so to put as much autonomy as you can to that local operating company. 
Obviously, we have some operating practices and policies they need to abide by. Um, we have regional teams that are in these companies all the time with a regional vice president, an accounting type person, service, safety. Um, they're visiting with these folks. On top of that, we do have some tripwires that you know, bids will come up here that I'll look at over $5 million, um, just to get another set of eyes for it. So, but what we really want the local operating company to do is take care of their people locally, take care of their customers locally. And then on a financial basis, for managing the accounting and collecting your money, that's done locally. Now, obviously, we have corporate accounts here that this all rolls up to. We're a public company that we can report to the SEC. We have internal auditing. So we have enough. I, this is something you got to look at every day, right? You got to make sure you have enough balance, um, both in terms of the decentralization and then what requirements we have as a public company to get done. And then to make sure that the type of work we're taking is work that we're good at, can do within our wheelhouse. So um, we try to keep that balance and you got to, you got to look at that constantly to make sure something doesn't get out of whack. But the key to me is if you hire local, your local operating company presidents are good, you're in good shape. That person isn't very good that you're going to have trouble no matter what. So that doesn't change. Compounders is brought to you in partnership with Tegas. We created Compounders to uncover the lessons and frameworks of the best capital compounders in the world. And if you are a professional investor, VC, or operator, and you appreciate the deep research into the businesses explored on this podcast, check out tegas.co slash compounders. With Tegas, you can learn about any company directly from former execs, current customers, and industry experts, all of which are in position to offer unique insights into companies' growth its customer value, and its competition. What makes Tegas different is that you don't have to lead your own expert calls. The platform offers instant access to the world's largest collection of investor-led call transcripts on companies such as Compounders Guests, Viasat, Element Solutions, and Avid Technology. All you have to do is log in and you'll get instant access to nearly 25,000 expert call transcripts. And the best part, the Tegas collection grows larger with each investor and company that joins. Still want to do your own expert calls? Tegas is the right solution. Experts that are just as good or better than what you'd find on other networks, but starting at just $300 per call, not the $1,000 or more others charge. If you're ready to go deeper on the next compounding business, head to tegas.co slash compounders for a free trial. I can personally say that having access to the Tegas platform and Rolodex of experts has fundamentally changed the quality of due diligence Coast Street does on both new and existing ideas. Let's move a little bit and talk about capital allocation. So this company has been quite acquisitive over its recent history. For example, in 2021, the company spent looks like about 200 million or more on acquisitions. Maybe talk a little bit about your acquisition philosophy and you know, kind of multiples and pricing discipline. How, how does that all work? So, Ben, I'll go on a little bit here because it's a really good question. And it's really where, you know, you're, if, if you're trying to learn about comfort systems, the blocking and tackling we do. And, but to grow, we really focus on acquisitions to get significant growth. We are very slow acquirers and we're not serial acquirers. We will. Um, take our time. It's all based on relationships here. We don't use outside sources. We do our own deals in-house. I'm very fortunate. I have a tremendous CFO here who does all the deals, meets the people, et cetera. Um, it starts the process. But it's people we really want to get to know. For example, we've known some company. We just bought a company in December. We've known them 25 years. We've known a bunch of them we know for 10 years. And we've stayed in touch with them because the number one thing is everybody will tell you is the culture. If you want to come into a company that's decentralized, you want to share best practices, and you want a home for your people that's in a contract, then we're a good place to come. But if that's not something you want to do and you just want to make as much money as you can, you're probably better off selling to someone else. It's your choice. So we have a tiered approach. Um, we want that company to be really good in the market they're in from a work perspective, but they're also good citizens of the communities they're in, right? And that uh, they're well-respected, they have a good workforce, and they have good customers. 
that's the fundamental premise and that have produced financial results, right? At the end of the day. Um, and we just take our time getting to know them, but we want them to get to know us. They're private companies coming into a public company. It's a different world. So you want to make sure that they're comfortable and understand that some of the things are going to change and it's a fellow requirement. So we take our time, we get to know them. We want to make sure the pricing fits with us. We can get a 12% IRR. We have no synergies we put in any of our deals um, in terms of financial metrics to justify it. And then we start introducing them to our training, sharing best practices, visiting other companies. And um, that's, that has worked well for us um, on a long-term basis. But you got to hold the discipline to me on the pricing. You can't fall in love with something and think you really need this company if it falls outside of bandwidth that we're comfortable with. We'll wait. And when you do indeed acquire a company, what do you think Comfort Systems brings to the table that eventually makes the acquired company even better over time? Yeah. So, you know, if we've picked the right company and they've picked the right people to sell to, it should be pretty straightforward. And it has been. Because by this time, we, we give every potential acquire a list of all our company presidents and tell them, call any one of them. And if the CFO and myself, if this is what we've told you, make sure it's what they're saying we are. Because if it's not, you shouldn't sell to us. So we really try to get off on a really good foot. We also have a third party do a pretty detailed assessment of their operational capability. So sort of day one, places for improvement, we've had someone document it already and try to go in there and help them with another company that might be good at it so they can send their folks up. So share your best practices, but showing them a company that's good at it, right? Plus all these companies are good at something too. So we try to take out from them. So it's a two way street. Um, so operationally that what we do um, on service, most of the time we need to help them with pricing. Um, historically, uh, we've seen private companies tend to run underestimate uh, what they can get in terms of pricing. But then also corporately, there's stuff in the back office we can take off that most of these guys don't like to do anyway. IT, cybersecurity, right? Comes to corporate. Cash management, banking, insurance. Our insurance rates are so low, it's an immediate win um, you know, for someone that joins us. All tax returns we do in here. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that they've been distracted by running their own private company that we take off their hands and let them focus on, you know, winning work, doing the work and collecting the money. And then we support them, you know, as best we can. So, um, but if you have the right company you bring in here that wants to get better themselves, it's a good place to come if they're open to, um, to doing that. Plus the training. If you call every one of the companies that we've bought at least the last 20 years, you'll say the biggest bang for the buck they got was the training that we have that they could not have done themselves. And then we do our training where we mix companies so that they get to meet other people that are superintendents and other companies. So, and plus safety, that's the biggest benefit. I think if the operating people would say right from the get go, they get. And you said you're not a serial acquirer. Yeah. So I, I hope you're not offended if I use the word roll up, but um, no, but it's, no. it's in certain situations in which a company's executed a successful roll up, investors often worry about the sustainability of that strategy. So maybe no. you can talk about, you say it's very fragmented. So maybe you can talk about the runway you have to continue to make attractively priced acquisition. Yeah, that's, um, there's a long runway. I mean, I'm way past my lifetime. Um, so a mechanical, so we do two types of acquisitions. One's a standalone company you're going to take in here and it's going to so you know, run themselves with their president. The other type we do is a bolt-on. We do a lot of bolt-ons, particularly in plumbing. Plumbing companies usually get to about 10, 15 million in revenue. Um, I'm, I'm talking about a standalone plumbing company. And we'll tuck that into an organization. Madison, Wisconsin, it's a good local plumbing company. You tuck them into our ongoing operation. Um, so there's two different versions of, um, uh, you know, of, of how we take how we take companies on. Um, but in terms of our ability to grow through acquisition, 
you know, we branched out into electrical probably five years ago. So we're really players there. And um, if you look at the number of opportunities that come in here every day um, on the mechanical front alone, uh, there's a long runway. I think what happened last year with the pending tax change, everybody was for sale. You couldn't do all the deals. I think we did four New Year's Eve, right? We were, we were exhausted New Year's Eve. We didn't go anywhere. We just sat here. Glad they were all done. Um, but now, you know, we've integrated them. So we're ready to probably get back in the game. But there's still plenty of opportunities. Um, we typically find someone when they hit 60, they start looking for what their options are. In the old days, right, the kids took it over. But you're seeing less and less of that today. Um, that they need another option to take care of their people. So um, there's, a, there's a long runway left in mechanical, electrical, plumbing, controls, life safety uh, before that runway goes away. And the other thing that often comes up in conversations with acquisitive companies is the breakdown between organic growth and acquired revenue. Mm. So, you know, sometimes cynical investors worry that deals are being done just to max the lack of organic growth. So maybe you can talk about the drivers of organic growth, just kind of from a macro basis for this company. And then, you know, give us, give, give listeners a sense of, of what you think this company can do on an organic basis. And I don't even know what a normal environment is anymore, but it's, assuming we ever get to that. Yeah. It's a good point. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time thinking about this, as you can imagine. So organically, we probably can go 2 to 4% range, GDP maybe a little bit more. Um, and then you get up a single digits when you acquire. So what we do not do um, is push growth very heavy. I know that's probably foreign to a lot of folks, but you can grow construction by five o'clock tonight if you want to. Just lower your bids, take the work. You, you can get all the work you want. It's something that we really fight against. We've got a job loop processing construction that sounds off. We're taking the right opportunities, work that we're good at, customers we know. You know, it's in our wheelhouse that we can get paid commensurate with the risk we're taking. So we really focus on construction. It's not so much growth. Although if you look at the growth we had in the second quarter, 25%, you got to go, Brian, what's that called? But it is, you know, we've had significant growth. But we really, really, really push operational efficiency. Let's get better at the work we have, produce it better, and then do good work. And I think we'll make more money that way than just growing at revenue. We really focus here on profit and cash flow, not revenue. Um, and then on service, it's the opposite. We push growth there. It's hiring salespeople, hiring service techs. Uh, we tripled the business in the last 10 years, and that's a full court press, board supported to keep growing service. So we really have two different strategies between service and construction. And I'd love to talk about the incentives and instruction, in, in, sorry, in construction for a moment. So there's always that tension between profitability and growth. Mm. And, um, you know, it's, it's often a balance that's hard to strike. So how do you incentivize people locally uh, to focus on profitability and not just growth at all costs? Uh, their bonus plan is off cash flow and profit. <laughs> no one in here gets a bonus off, including me, off revenue. No one. Um, and this comes from the chairman of the board on down. Um, we have a lot of guys out there making, you know, pretty good money. Um, so our incentive plan, they all have a base salary, but the incentive plan is tied to profit and cash flow. We are driven by cash flow here. Cash is king. It's king in every contractor. You should cash flow your earnings. So we really focus on people, you know, collecting the money for the work that we did. So if you do those two things, you will be rewarded for it. Now, if you grow the business, obviously your profit can go up. But we just don't want people sacrificing profit and cash flow to say they've just grown their business. Um, I, we just don't think it's worth it. Um, we think our, people's time is too valuable. We think we spend too much time training them, doing really good work for our customers, just to dilute it by taking work at really lower margins. So that's our philosophy. And if I look at the map uh, in your presentation, uh, there's a lot of white space for this company in the Western part of the U.S. specifically. Yeah. 
So maybe you can talk about your strategy uh, as it relates to entering new markets and maybe ex expound on greenfield versus acquisition. How do you think about, how do you balance those two? So I'm not a fan of greenfield at all, less than zero. Um, in this business, if you're going to greenfield something, pick a town in Oklahoma, you're going to have to take somebody else's workforce, someone else's customers. I think that's just a, you know, a tough road to hoe from scratch with people that have relationships for 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, they go into the same church together. Their kids play baseball together. That is a tough, tough thing to break. I'd rather buy, even if it's a small company, to get to get us started. So, you know, that's that's my opinion on green. I'm not saying I'm right. It's just, and when I'm gone, maybe the next guy I'll do something else, but I'm not doing it. But yeah, there is a lot of white space. But what we we don't worry geographically. I have no strategy geographically on acquisitions. It's all based on the quality of the company that we think we can get. Um, and if we've spent time them, I spend a lot of time with them. Um, and if they think we think they're kind of people, I don't I don't care where they are. Um, that's really our prime focus. Um, and right now we've done a lot in the Southeast, as you probably can see. That's where population's moving to. Most of the manufacturing's coming back to. So if you look sort of Washington, D.C., down through Texas, that corridor over to Arizona, probably. If you look at the amount of reshore and manufacturing that comes back to there, that's, that's why we're there. We just followed what the census put out 30 years ago, saying that's where the population was going. If you look at Texas, it's 25% of our business. But you look at the growth in Texas, right? It's, it's through the roof, right? You, you look at Dallas, it's, it's San Antonio, it's crazy in Florida. So we've just sort of followed uh, the people and that's where the bulk of it is. If we find something, you know, up in Midwest we are in these other territories, we'd buy them. But most of them are pretty, they're not really congested areas of people. and. We need people to be air conditioned or cooled or whatever you need them to have. So that that's our philosophy. So we're we're heavy in the south. In and terms of Bostonian telling you we're heavy in the south. So. <laughs> <laughs> and in terms of the size of potential acquisitions, are there really large deals out there? Maybe say two hundred and fifty to five hundred million in enterprise value, or is there just so much fragmentation that you're not going to find very many companies that size? There are some, but there are very few, probably less than 10 that are non-union and mechanical, to be, to be honest. Uh, electrical is a little bit different. There's bigger electrical companies. We have the biggest electrical in Texas. That was a $400 million revenue company when we bought it. Um, so the electrical companies, that's why I don't want to say never. You might see us do something bigger in electrical, but mechanical, there's a few left. We know them. They know us. Probably if they were going to sell, um, you know, they, we'd probably do something with them. But there's not a lot because of the fragmentation. But electrical, I think there's uh, quite a few more. And do you have a preference between a, just, I guess, from a strategic point of view between mechanical and electrical? Like, are you saying we want to be bigger in electrical and we're going to put more money there? Or, again, it goes back to tell me what the company is. And that's I just care about that, you know, who, who, who do we be buying as opposed to what, what they're doing? Uh, yes, it's so we delved into electrical probably 215, 2016, where we decided um, we spent a lot of time studying electrical. And the way we got into it, we bought a mechanical that had like a $30 million electrical component to it. And the reason for that is that we wanted to take a couple of years to really study electrical, the type of work it was, what's similar to mechanical, what was different. Um, and then we started going to electrical. So I think we're just looking for good companies first with the mechanical electrical. But, um, I, you know, we, we are looking for electrical to hopefully get them both the same size at some point. And we've talked about service a little bit, but I'd like to dig in there more. So re recurring revenue models are clearly in vogue these days. You know, I know this company isn't selling enterprise software. But um, according to your presentation, about 20% of your revenue is tied to service. So maybe you can talk about how you've gone about building that up. You've talked about a full court press towards growth, how you've done that. And, you know, from a customer's perspective, like what, what, what is your value proposition? What is, what's mission critical about what you're doing there? 
You know, Ben, it, it's funny because I'm an old construction guy, right? So they, uh, and we always had service here. I got here in 2003, there was service, but um, around 2010, um, we had a couple of board members that were ex equipment manufacturing guys where service was a huge part of their business. And they ground me into submission, Ben, in service, but. I'm joking, but service is a really good business, right? The margins are higher and the risk is lower. So I don't think you need to go get an MBA for that one. So, but the thing that, you, that, you know, I had to learn about service, you know, we talked about, you can grow construction pretty fast if you really wanted to. Not service. It is a slow growth um, business. And the key is sell the maintenance agreements, you know, one, three, five year. I'm going to come into the business here and there. We're going to do X amount, one, two, three times a year. So selling those agreements is the base of your service business. And you need salespeople to do it. And, um, and those might be as low as five grand a year. They might be upwards of 100. So when you're selling that level of increment, it's going to take you a long time to triple your business, right? And it's a lot of stick to itiveness to it. So... Um, we really dug in our heels, made a few mistakes. Um, we got the training better on hiring and retaining salespeople. And then, of course, you got to get service techs to do the work. And, you know, they're like gold these days, finding a good service tech. Um, but, it, but it's a great opportunity for someone, you know, that wants to join the business. So we just started, um, you know, putting real money into it. Um, we reported on it every quarter on our calls, how much we we're spending. And um, then you had to rework your processes to get bigger, right? And then to get the technology. And then we had a bunch of companies that were really good at it. So we used their models to help the other companies grow. And then, of course, we had a bunch of construction guys that were pretty neutral on service. Now, everybody has service, but you know, we had to convince a few of them that, to spend the time. So it was a lot of missionary work. Um, but right now, it's part of our culture, big part of our business. And what's really important about it, I think you asked a really good question about, you know, why is it important, right? Well, you look at this whole host of reasons. It's mechanical equipment, right? It's going to break. It is going to break. So the better you can be at forecasting, predicting maintenance and predicting when it's going to, your building won't go down or your shop or your manufacturing facility or whatever you have won't go down because people now are not going to work in a building that's too hot or too cold, right? Temperature's going to be just right. Um, so helping our customers with that has been crucial. Um, and it's a lot of call-out work. If something goes down, right, they want you Johnny on the spot, you know, there as quick as you can get it, fix it right the first time, and, you know, and get there quickly. So, and it can be a good lead into, you know, we do construction. Hopefully you can get the service work, although there's a warranty period that the equipment guys get, but it's a good lead into that. But also on the maintenance base, Ben, you can get about 2 to $3, what I call pull through work for every dollar maintenance base. So I'm going to go out there, check your system, but the compressors broke. So on average, that's a, a mini project that we'll do. So you get a lot of project work out of having, you know, Good, um, good service agreements. But the key is you want to keep your customers building, building up and running because they need it for people to be there. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's the key metric. We have 24 hour monitoring um, that if we see someone like you take a Nike store, it's getting too hot. We can see it. First thing we tell them to do is go check if the doors open. Right. And you have a whole series of protocols because people won't change if it's too hot. You know, change clothes. So there's all kinds of services we provide to people on service to keep the temp temperature comfortable. And technology has advanced quite substantially, um, um, you know, recently, whether it's Internet of Things or, you know, the ability for a unit on top of a, of a, a, a roof to actually send data back mm -hmm. potentially so that you can have predictive maintenance. Are you seeing your OEM partners, you know, getting better at that? And, and what is that? What is the long term impact for you guys? If if, you know, whatever the air conditioner is going to tell you two weeks before it breaks, that it, it is going to break. 
Yeah, you know, there's a lot of Internet of Things. I think it's really early days. It's been around for a long time. People talking about it. Um, some a lot of places struggling to make it work. Um, but let's face it, there's more and more data coming out of buildings that people want to capture. Um, you know, a nice a nice add-on to what you talked about there is how much energy efficiency we're doing for companies now. Um, that I forgot to mention in the last question you had. That really ties into the to Internet of Things and the quality of building, people measuring emissions more. Um, so we're doing a lot of work um, upgrading people's buildings with COVID, right? More airflow going through a building. We have over 100 leads professionals accredited working with our customers to improve airflow, energy efficiency, just the overall quality of the year. And I think um, that. I think the technology will catch up, but there's so much data coming out. There's still data analytic processes that need to be improved. And I know there's a lot of people trying to work on it, but even for the OEMs, they need still need someone to do the work. So if you take the big equipment guys, train, you know them, train, carrier, et cetera. Um, you know, we buy their equipment. We partner with them sometimes on jobs and sometimes we compete. Um, but I, I think for the most part, the Internet of Things will eventually change how buildings are monitored, and it'll be for the better. And one thing that has always struck me, or especially in recent times about this company, is the very attractive returns on equity this company generates, averaging greater than 20% over the last few years. So maybe give people a sense for how this company generates such attractive returns and you know, give me a sense of why they would be sustainable over time. Well, first and foremost, right, you have to do good work for your customers, right? At the end of the day, everybody can talk a big game, worry about this and that, but if you're not servicing your customers, um, it's not going to matter. I think the other thing we've done is we've gotten to more complex work. Our acquisitions, particularly in the modular front, um, we have a big footprint in tech now with companies you can't use their names, but we do a lot of data center work that's just nonstop at the moment. Uh, big facilities, fast. We did a lot of COVID work that was very high margin work because of the speed they required. We do a lot of pharma work, life science work, and food processing that are all very active right now. I think the complexity of the work and the increased service margins, you know, will, will keep our returns up. But we got to keep doing good work, right? You can't let up one minute, focus on the blocking and tackling. Um, and we should, you know, keep our, our returns up there. We've had good return on equity, you know, for a long time. And you know, there's nothing that should stop that. And if I think about just looking at the margins specifically, gross mm -hmm. margins tend to be in the 18 to 20% range. Is that basically what investors should expect as a base level of profitability or are there certain verticals and then maybe more service that could you know eventually as it gets to be a bigger part of the business kind of drag those margins up over time i i i never tell someone a number that we've never done right because that that's just not right but i think if you're in the 17 to 20 percent rate i think 20 percent we had a couple of quarters we were at 21 that was more during covid when you know, they needed stuff done in six weeks because of the vaccine, right? That was when you had every everybody you had working on this stuff. Um, I think you're in a 17 to 20% range. The field is doing a good job on the work that they have. 20% um, if, um, you know, you got a good economy going. 17 if things get a little tighter. But as we continue to grow service, Ben, as you just alluded to, that's the key to keeping us to maintain those margins up. As we grow more and more of that service business, um, that should at least sustain it or allow it to increase a little bit. But 20% is the highest we've done consistently. 18 has been sort of what we've been, you know, hitting on a pretty steady clip. Um, but um, that's, you know, as we get more automation, more technology, I think all that thing's going to help our margins for sure. And getting digging a little bit more on the margin question, pricing power and inflation are very big topics at the moment. 
maybe a little talk a little bit about um, where you've experienced the most inflation. I assume labor's not a not not an, a trivial thing there, and then also talk about how your efforts like what is it mechanistically how do you get pricing and how have those efforts gone. So I'm going to break down the inflation a little bit. Is that okay? Um, because I think it's it's. I'll give you today's snapshot because it's all over the place. Um, inflation's high, no matter what anybody wants to say. It is. It's high, <laughs> and we're feeling it every day. Um, but there's two components of it. One is pricing, and one is availability. Um, I worry about more availability than I do about pricing. Because if I have a job site going, I can't get the equipment. We have a lot of people standing there, you know, standing around. So pricing and availability on labor. We talked about labor's tight. Wages are going up. Um, it's because you have no choice. And they need it, right? Inflation's high, right? They need the help. If you talk about commodities, pipe valves and fittings, common stuff you might see at Home Depot, that pricing has stabilized and there's adequate supply. So we have no issues right now with that. Equipment is the biggest problem today. Pricing's up, but availability, anything with an electronic chip is delayed. Um, and it's a lot of our stuff's a year out on lead times. If you look at electrical switch gear and generators, it's minimum a year. So the availability on the equipment as well as the pricing is the issue. How do you, what do you do contractually? You, you put clauses in there as best you can. Um, you do change orders. Uh, if things are, are way out of whack. What, what's interesting today, Ben, is the customers know what's going on, general contractors. So a lot of times you'd see inflation just in one sector, right? Or one particular thing, but everybody's seeing it everywhere. So it's not like you have to, educate them on you know where, where it is and inflation's hitting the most um but um the other thing we really try to get our customers to commit to is if you give us a purchase order we will order everything the next day and i talked earlier in our conversation about the strength of our balance sheet well, it's really helping us right now. So if we do get a purchase over for company X, rather than take the risk of pricing on equipment changing, we will audit equipment the next day. And that's a help to us. Um, our average project size is 777,000. So it's not big. Most of them are done within six to nine months. So there is some just pure operational mechanisms that allow us to protect ourselves from inflation as well. So contractually, change orders and the length of our projects, I think are helping us keep our margins what they are today. And another thing that I'm sure is keeping you on your toes a little bit is concerns about an economic downturn and people are talking about recessions now. Um, I, guess, I guess one difference between now and maybe a, a decade ago or, or, or into kind of 2008, 2009 is the balance this business has from the service side. But I'd love to hear a little bit about how this business has performed during economic downturns in the past and how you'd hope to perform if indeed we are heading into a tough economic environment? No, so at a very high level, we've made money every year and we produce cash all 25 years of our existence. We've had positive cash flow. The one on the recessionary front um, is we're a variable cost business, right? We have very little fixed costs, you know, some rolling stock bands and stuff, but Typical construction companies have massive amounts of equipment. You just don't have it. So um, things get bad enough, right? You just, you know, you reduce your force, um, which is what we've had to do a few times. Not what you want to do, but you have to do, right? You got you to gotta protect the enterprise um, and protect everybody else here. But what's going to be interesting, even if we had a downturn, labor is so short, I don't know how much you're going to feel it. And I'm not... I'm trying to give you a sales job on it, but I mean, we're seven days a week right now. Um, so even if we had a slowdown, it'd probably be a good thing for us at this point. Um, but in recessions, you know, you reduce your, you reduce your workforce. And um, you know, that's how we've done in the past and what we do again. One advantage we have as an industry is that we tend to be a year, a year and a half lag 
So if you go into recession tomorrow, we won't feel it for almost two years. The corollary is when it gets better, we won't feel it better for two years either. So, um, so we'll have plenty of time to see it coming and make the adjustments we need to make. And let's jump back into capital allocation for a moment. Dividends have historically been a key aspect of this um, company's capital return strategy. Why has the dividend been the preference versus buybacks? And then how do you balance that buyback versus dividend decision? So our capital allocation strategy is about 70% we put back into acquisitions. And the remaining 30% we split between dividend and buybacks. Um, and that's a board-directed allocation because they want, at the simplest level, shareholders to get money back regularly. Does not wait till they sell the stock. Um, so the dividend policy, we've tried to add a penny or two every year for the last, I don't know, 10 years or so. Um, and on buybacks, it is, we like buying back our stock because we think we're a good investment. And we, we, I know maybe the government has a different view of this, but we think it's a good message to our shareholders that we buy our own stock as well as the people that work here on stock, right? It's a message to everybody. Why would you buy our stock if we don't believe in it, right? So it's that's one of the reasons. But the board has a predetermined amount they'll buy at different sales prices. So we do not control that on a day-to-day -day basis. It really depends on the price and how much has been allocated to that by them. Um, but we've been, over the last 12 years, that mix has been 70-30 has held up. and. So one year we might do a little bit more acquisitions or we might buy back more stock like we have this year and dividend, but it all balances out to about that. But we like our stock and we will keep buying it. And what's your thought on the right amount of leverage for a business like this? Mm -hmm. And has that changed over time? Have you become more or less comfortable deploying the balance sheet in, you know, for an, an acquisition, for example? Well, I'm pretty conservative. So um, this is not a good industry, in our opinion, to have a lot of debt in because it's cyclical. And um, we try to keep it to about one trillion of EBITDA is our preferred amount. We went up above that to about a turn and a half at the end of the year, but about now we're, we're close to a turn again. So as soon as we get to debt, we tend to we like to pay it back. Um, as fast as possible before we buy more, um, just to keep within that window. And, and a big driver for that is the bonding company. So we do a fair bit of bonded work, and the bonding company totally evaluates you off your balance sheet about how strength you are. Our bonding rate is the lowest other than Skanska, which is backed by the government of Sweden. So we are really proud of that bonding rate and the advantage it gives our companies to get some work. So we want to keep that debt um, uh, within a reasonable level about a turn. Some of that's our philosophy, the board's philosophy, and based on the industry that, that we're in. I just, um, I don't want to, you know, you get a recession and you get too much debt. It's, we have a lot, even our operating companies, believe it or not, these guys were entrepreneurs, started this business in the garage, whatever they did, they put their houses up. But when we have a little bit of debt, I'll start getting some calls about what we're doing. <laughs> so, you know, we got to be pretty conservative in this industry, I think. You know, it's interesting. I feel like public investors and maybe myself included are just always focused on that balance sheet number, like net debt to EBITDA or something like that. But there are all these other things like what are your customers thinking? What are the rating agencies thinking? What are the bonding companies thinking? Like there's all this this benefit to having a better balance sheet and being you know, conservatively financed that we don't really see on a day-to-day -day basis, but certainly impact your business. You know, it's even, Ben, that's a really good point. It's even surprisingly the people that work here that notice it, right? Not, I'm not talking about guys out in the field, but in our operating companies, you know, want to make sure we don't get over our skis either, right? Because they know the importance of everyone that works in this company, all 14,000 have been through downtimes, have been through some tough times. And they realize that at the end of the day, that balance sheet, you know, is our anchor that that keeps us um, from from sinking. So uh, they pay a lot more attention to it than I ever thought they would. <laughs> We've talked a lot about culture 
so far. And I, I love that. Um, but I would love to drill down just a little more. You know, you've talked about safety. You've talked about, t- you've talked about taking care of the customer. Any other cultural elements you try to embed? Um, and then maybe discuss if the cultures had to evolve over time in any way that you can, can highlight. Well, we, we have five fundamental values, and I know their value is written on a piece of paper. Everybody puts them all over the walls and everything else, and they think they have values. But ours are pretty simple. One is be safe, be honest, be respectful, be, in, be innovative, and be collaborative. Um, and that's the foundation of our culture. So we do a lot of training on these values, and, and I'm talking about even in the field, I, I think a lot of things have changed, I think, for the better from when I started in particular. Um, how, how we treat people uh, of all you know, colors, whatever, whatever it is, um, I think being more respectful of people, that's why it's on our list, is it's really important to us. We, at every training, will talk about these values but give time to ethics. We spend, I think, good ethics are the founda- integrity of the foundation of your company. I think if we can't trust you, you really shouldn't be here. Um, and I, I personally have no time for bad behavior. If, you know, if you've done something we've investigated, it's true, you're gone. I, I hold a whole line there. I think it's really important that everybody that works here um, can feel comfortable coming to work. And, you know, we want to get more women in construction. We want more women to job site. I think women make great welders, for example, right? And we are increasing the amount of women. Well, you want them to be comfortable at a job site, right? As, as they should be. So you asked me what's changed maybe from when I started. I think the balance of maybe a little bit more mutual respect is in there. A lot of the uh, sort of the good old boy uh, phrases are gone, which is good. Um, but it's something, you know, we have everybody take a class every year, sign off on our ethics, make sure they understand. I don't want anybody fired here for doing something irresponsible if we haven't told them. I don't think that's right. So every time I give anything I say, I start off with those values and go through every one of them about what I think is important. And, and then if you go astray from any of them, it's probably going to be me pulling the plug on you. I just don't want anybody to be surprised. But I think it's really important in today, we're way more diverse. We're probably 50% Hispanic in the field. We've improved our content of every race, nationality you can imagine, which is fantastic. It's, it, it's great. This corporate office is a mix. It's I think all those things are really healthy, but you also got to make sure your culture allows it to be absorbed, right? Be prospered. I go on, I'm sorry, I'm going off on a tangent, but I think this is really important today um, that people have a place to come because these people can leave tomorrow and get a job, right? You guys can leave tomorrow and get a job with the way the job market is. So I want people to really want to be here, like being here and want to come here. And I think it's a good segue to ask about your legacy personally. So let's say we're looking, you know, I don't know how many years out we're talking, but we're, you know, 10 years out and you're looking back. Like what, what do you think you'd like your legacy to be, um, the, what you left at Comfort Systems? I took care of the people that were here, trained them, allowed them to do the best that they can do, um, gave people opportunities, um, just became a more diverse, better company. If I walked out of here, and I think the financials, I, people say, I just want people here to say this was a really good place to work, and that guy helped it. I'm all, you probably, I'm all about the field. Um, I, I came from the field. <laughs> but a lot of times those folks get overlooked, right, because they're somewhere. It's, it's 100 degrees in Texas, and they're on a roof somewhere. It's probably 120. They should be treated with respect. Right. That's that what feeds us. That's what pays the bills around here. So I try to make it important that I take people in this corporate office job site once in a while, not to make them a welder electrician, just to show them what the work is. Right. To say, 
And people really, really like that. But, you know, that's the heart and soul. That's where it begins and ends, you know, so. As a firm, we like to focus on key variables that are going to drive, a, you know, a company or a stock's performance over time. So what, what do you think are three companies, this, sorry, three things this company absolutely has to get right for the stock to be a good investment for both uh, your investors and your employees over the next few years? Yeah. I think the first thing we got to make sure we continue to do good work for our customers, right? There is no, you're not going to get repeat work if the work isn't good. You you can lose a customer in five minutes, take it 20 years to get it. You can lose them in a year. Um, so that's, the, you know, that's, you know, that's number one that investors should be, you know, con concerned about thinking, not concerned about make sure we do. And second thing is, that we've continued to move on the technology front and get fall behind. And the third thing is that we produce cash because at the end of the day, that's really how people value us. But I, I just like to talk a little bit about technology. One more thing that we've done. We've invested in a fund called Bricks and Mortar, which is a collection of specialty contractors, a number of other folks to try technology. So it's like a venture capital fund. They're seeing a ton of technologies come through and the ones that apply to mechanical electrical, they'll send to us. We'll try it out and see if it's good or not. Because there is so much technology coming. You talked about IoT, et cetera, that it overwhelms an organization like us. But having a group of people all in the room evaluate it before we can send it out to our companies is huge. And we've been in that for about eight months now. And it's really helped us sort of you know, weed out technology that just really not going to help us. So, but I think, I think the companies that absorb that get more efficient, can do more with less labor. Those are the ones that will win the game long term. And quick question on that. Was that your baby? Was that from the board? Where did, how did that even come about that? that Cause it seems like a little bit far afield, but, but clearly. Yeah, they brought it to me the first time I thought I sent them out. I says, thanks for coming. Get out of here. No, we had a, we have a, we, we, we've got a, a young, Young, everybody's young to me, right? So what am I saying? Um, but we have a uh, we have a guy here in the corporate office that's really into technology, and um, he found that somebody already had done a fund like this before. He followed it, and then we spent a lot of time with it. We thought it was a great vehicle because he was sort of screening them all and was overwhelmed, and found this is a great way. So what he does focus now is take the ones that we can apply. So we've taken them off screening a thousand of them, taken two that we think will really help us. So we do, we just become more efficient and productive, but it came from one person. It wasn't for me or anybody else. And he was just some person with a really good interest in it, which is, I guess most things happen that way. Isn't it? Someone has a real interest and, yeah. you know, don't let it go and wouldn't let us say no. So it was, yeah. And you have to have an organization that's flexible enough to, to, yeah. you know, work with that person. That's important as well. Absolutely. So we've covered a lot, and and I think we've we've really hit on you know, a lot of cultural items, financial items, capital allocation items. So I think that, that like it's been a really good overview of the company. So we're going to close with our favorite question and the one we ask all of our guests. What would you say is the most misunderstood or underappreciated aspect of your company, business, stock? However you want to answer it. Everybody needs us. It's what I tell everybody that works here when they were telling everybody, when they sell the maintenance agreement, you take them to the window. There's a lot of buildings outside this window. I'm like, how can we go wrong? Everyone needs, we live in Houston. You kind of need air conditioning and you need heat up north. So I think that's an important thing is, in this specialty contracting skill, no buildings work without us, right? This concrete, I don't know what you're, what you're in there, but electrical and mechanical is making everything work. So I, this is a long-term business that's not going to go away. There's not going to be a substitute for mechanical electrical. Maybe how electricity is produced, but electricity won't go away. I think the second thing is, and I hope the importance of the trades, the, the importance of that we don't stigmatize that your kids have been failures if they wind up in the trades. I know everybody wants to go to college and Listen, we're pro college, um, but I think there's a lot of people out there that they're either sitting at home, 
or in college that probably could make a doggone good living. And I think that's way misunderstood is it's not like when my dad did it. Um, people are making a doggone good living in the trades today. And um, if you come in here and perfect it, the sky's the limit how far you can go in these companies. I mean, the sky is the limit. Um, and I think thirdly, the technology, particularly what we've done on prefabrication and modular, I think we're the dominant player in modular right now in this country. It's a great technology. Um, the tech people love it. Pharma people love it. We can build a mechanical room in half the time that you can do it stick build or build it out in the field. So I think those three things are what drives our organization and you know drives the profitability that we're achieving. Well, this company's enjoyed quite a lot of success since you came on as CEO and um, looks like you're set up for a lot more. So Brian, thank you so much for being on Compounders. We really appreciate you taking the time. Ben, thank you very much. I appreciate it. That's it for our show today. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. We recognize that you have a lot of different podcast choices and we appreciate you spending the time with us. We are continually working to make the show better and we would love your feedback. The more candid and honest, the better. And if you have any suggestions for public company CEOs you would like to see on the podcast, please let us know. And of course, warm intros are always appreciated. Please feel free to email us at podcast at co-streetcapital.com with your comments or suggestions. Thanks again, and stay tuned for the next episode of Compounders, Anatomy of a Multibagger.